It took 30 days to paint a coach. It took just as long to paint the first automobiles. Now it takes less than four hours. Paint has responded to a changing world since its earliest beginnings. The first painters were hunters. Inspired perhaps by the shapes they saw in the rock, they created a vivid world of animals. What were these pictures for? We can only guess. But we do know how they painted them. They used materials that lay at hand. A piece of charred wood or bone for drawing the outlines and hot animal fat for binding their simple earth colors. The smooth head of a leg bone and a hollow stone served as pestle and mortar, and the bruised fibers of a green stick as a paintbrush. The paste dried to a thin waterproof film of color. From its beginnings, 30,000 years ago, paint has been not only decorative, but durable. Bitumen was prized for its protective qualities by the early civilizations of Mesopotamia. This too was a naturally occurring material. Pigment and binding medium in one. Used to waterproof boats made from woven reeds. The pharaohs employed artists to decorate their palaces, temples, and tombs. They covered their walls with story pictures and painted the figures and household objects that were buried with the dead for company in the afterlife. The tools and materials they used have survived. Clay pots for mixing paints, palettes, reed brushes, and pigments. Like the cave painters, they used earths and chalks, but extended their palette with more colorful minerals. Malachite, hematite, orpiment, Azurite, and most interesting of all, Egyptian blue. This was the first synthetic pigment. Silica, malachite, and calcium carbonate fused together at a critical temperature. Wall paintings were usually carried out on dry plaster. The pigments were bound with gums, honey, and size, thinned with water rather like the water paints and distemper still in use today. Indeed, the Egyptians were the first to have a real grasp of paint technology. The Greeks and Romans adopted similar methods but their interest in solid form resulted in a very different style of painting. 
they also learned to paint directly onto wet plaster, which absorbed the pigment and bound it as it dried. The beginning of fresco, the technique Michelangelo was to use to paint the Sistine Chapel. This portrait, painted shortly before the fall of the Roman Empire, was done in quite a different way, using beeswax. The Greeks used these wax-bound paints as a protective coating on their ships of war. So did the Romans. They had to be applied hot. For painting pictures, they were melted on a heated bronze pallet and applied to a wooden panel with a brush or a spatula. And so, round the shores of the Mediterranean, paint slowly evolved from its crude beginnings to become a remarkably versatile material. A thousand years later, the arts of these early pagan civilizations had been transformed in the service of the Christian church. The books written and copied by the monks of the religious orders were superbly illuminated. These manuscripts create a vivid world of saints and flowers and strange beasts. But from their pages we can also see something of the real world and how it was decorated. The painter of this vaulted ceiling was master of a craft that had changed little since antiquity. Most of the materials he used were those of Egypt, Greece, and Rome. He acquired his skills through long years of apprenticeship, learning how to decorate churches, palaces, chests, and shields, banners, saddles, and ships of war. There was as yet no clear distinction between craftsman and artist, but this was to come. The skills of the illuminator were soon to be extended beyond the confines of the page. Preoccupation with fine detail remained. The care the artist lavished on his painting was reflected in the way he prepared his materials. Painting in egg tempera was an exacting technique peculiar to the Middle Ages. The artist mixed the yolk with his chosen pigment and a little water. He would prepare a range of the tones he wanted, for say the painting of a red robe. His brush, made from specially chosen hairs of ermine set in a goose quill, had to be the finest. onto a smooth ground of chalk or gypsum, bound with rabbit skin glue, called gesso. He applied the color stroke by stroke. The paint dried rapidly, so modeling and shading could be built up finely in thin, superimposed layers. The techniques of painting were generally handed down by example and word of mouth, but from time to time they were written down. One of the most interesting manuscripts is by Theophilus, a Benedictine monk of the 12th century. Take the pounded seed of flax, place it in a pan with a little water, and heat strongly. Afterwards, fold it in a new cloth and place it in a press so that the oil may be extracted. This is Theophilus giving instructions for making what were to become the most widely used materials of artists and craftsmen alike, linseed oil and varnish. Grind red or vermilion with this oil upon a stone without water. Then with a paintbrush, apply it over the doors and panels that you want to stain red and dry them in the sun. Finally, apply over it a coat of the sticky substance called varnish, which is made in this way.
put some linseed oil in a small new pot and add some finely powdered gum called Sandorac. Heat it carefully. Every painting coated with this varnish becomes bright and decorative and completely durable. But the oil paint and varnish Theophilus described were also stiff, sticky, and slow to dry. Suitable enough for doors, furniture, and farm implements but incapable of producing fine decorative detail. The problem of painting in oils was only overcome 300 years later in the subtle work of the Flemish artists of the 15th century. They were the first to perfect the technique by using a solvent. Alchemists had discovered that the resin tapped from pine trees could be distilled to produce turpentine, a volatile liquid which could be used to thin the paint. Now the artist could make his paint creamy enough for detailed work with a fine brush. The techniques of Van Eyck and his followers have never been surpassed. Their love of fine detail and high finish stemmed from their work as illuminators. Within the confines of the page, their superb craftsmanship had created a world alive with atmosphere. Now they could translate it to the larger scale of the easel picture, which has remained the principal medium of artistic expression ever since. The development of paint during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance also had an influence on decoration. As time went on, the distinction between artist and craftsman became more pronounced. But like the artist, the craftsman made his own paint from materials supplied by the apothecary. Some of the more exotic ingredients were costly, bought by the ounce. Paint was a luxury. Decoration became more elaborate and sophisticated, and the demand for paint increased. By the end of the 17th century, the apothecary shop had given way to oil merchants, color men, and distillers. The scale of paint making had changed, but its manufacture was still based on the proven recipes of the artist. In the search for more colors, the earths of the cave painters and the minerals of the Egyptians had been augmented with terre verte, cinnabar, Railgar and lapis lazuli. This was the source of ultramarine, the pig from over the sea. The preparation of other pigments was more complex. Chemical processes were involved. The reaction of fermenting grapes with copper made a green, verdigris, and with lead a pure white which became red when heated. The fermented leaves of the indigo plant gave a very dark blue. From buckthorn berries came a yellow dye made into a pigment by precipitating it on chalk or alum. There was a whole range of these organic pigments extracted from petals, berries, roots, and even the crushed bodies of insects such as cochineal.
the yellow gamboge was a solid resin from Cambodia. Dragon's blood came from the fruit of the East Indian rattan palm. Paint had gained much from the trade which followed the voyages of discovery. The import of gums and resins grew rapidly. Tragacanth and acacia, mastic, dammer and copal came from Africa and India by the ton for blending with the oils of walnut, poppy, and linseed. And from the pine forests of North America came turpentine for thinning almost every kind of paint. The influence of trade was far-reaching. From the East came not only gums, resins, and dye stuffs, but the lacquered wares of China and Japan. The secret of this immaculate finish proved elusive, but its popularity assured its imitation. Blends of linseed, nut, and lavender oils were cooked with amber, copal, calophony, and sandarac to elaborate and secret recipes. Lacquer work became so popular that the demand could no longer be met by small groups of craftsmen. Factories were built to produce Japan goods in quantity. In its turn, varnish making was to become an industry in its own right. These varnish factories still relied on the traditional skills of the individual craftsmen. Testing for temperature was still rudimentary. But they marked the beginnings of the modern paint industry. Along with pigment makers, oil refiners, and turpentine distillers, they supplied the materials of the trade to an increasingly wide market. The coach was the summit of the painter's craft. Coat after coat of primer, filler, color, and varnish meticulously applied to achieve a brilliant and lasting finish. But just as coach painting reached the peak of refinement, the dictates of fashion were swept aside by the more urgent demands of the Industrial Revolution. artists of the new age were the engineers. Their works were bold and justly celebrated. But built of iron, they suffered from one great drawback, rust. The 19th century turned to paint not only for decoration, but for protection, on a scale for which it was unprepared. This was paint by the acre. Manufacturers experimented with new processes, with new lead and zinc-based paints to combat rust and corrosion. But as the century advanced, the limitations of paint became clear. Its performance was no match for this harsh new environment, nor for what was to follow, a revolution in the techniques of industrial production. Mass production meant the end of paint making as a traditional craft. The end of recipes derived from the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. Craftsmanship gave way to chemistry. materials of paint have changed more in the last 30 years than in the previous 30,000. Evolved on the laboratory bench, 
and processed through chemical plants on an industrial scale, the new synthetic resins look much the same as those of the past. The difference between them lies in the shapes of their molecules, their predetermined arrangement and distribution, the product of reactions between glycerol and phthalic anhydride, epichlorhydrin and diphenylol propane, polyols and isocyanates, vinyls and acrylics. Armed with these and with solvents, each made to a specification equally precise. Armed with dryers and plasticizers, wetting and dispersing agents, the paint manufacturer has overcome the problems of an industrial age. a crucial role, controlling corrosion, advancing the speeds of mass production. In industry, paint is both chemistry and engineering. Along with a change in its raw materials, there's been a revolution in methods of applying it. Adapting to the processes of modern industry, paint has changed out of all recognition. But it is more than a protective coating, more than a surface finish ingeniously applied. Paint is color. And today, color too is chemistry. Synthetic pigments not only answer the stringent needs of industry, they crown the age-long search of the artist for stable, durable color. Paint is decoration, a unique form of individual expression, universally available for every man's castle, every woman's home. Paint is older than the wheel. Its manufacture is now a great industry based on science. But it owes its existence to art. To man's enduring urge to give form and color to his experience of the world around him. An urge which goes back to his earliest beginnings. 